If you look around my office, you might have realized I have kind of a love for dark and twisted cartoons. And a lot of that may be because I grew up with a lot of dark and twisted cartoons. Now, I'm not talking about the ones like Batman or the ones meant for older kids. I'm talking about the ones meant for little, little kids and probably should have been made for little, little kids. And I loved the hell out of them. I loved how much they scared me. I loved how every time you got through one, you felt a little tougher. So I'm doing a series reacting and reviewing them. We're gonna analyze how creative they are, how dark they are, and if the dark twisted tone was warranted. So join me in taking a look at some dark tunes. What does Disney do with an adorable singing animal? Same thing they do with a lot of adorable singing animals. The Whale Who Wanted to Sing at the Met, or Willy the Operatic Whale, was released in 1946. It was part of a Disney film that was a collection of shorts called Make My Music, but sometimes it's just shown on its own. Let's take a look. So this was written by Irvin Graham, who for some reason is not credited in the Make My Music title card here, but whenever they release it as a short, he's given credit there. And this film is a result of Disney going through World War II at the time, and they did make movies like uh, Snow White and Pinocchio and so forth, but once World War II started, uh, not only were half the animators drafted, but the other half that remained were working on World War II films, either propaganda shorts or even shorts to show the army how to operate, you know, how to fly a plane and so on and so forth. So they had all these ideas ready to go. Most of them were just going to be their own animated features or even just their own individual shorts. But because uh, times were really tough and money was tight, they would release these compilations. So there's other ones like uh, Fun and Fancy Free or Melody Time is another popular one. And uh, this one's one of my favorites. This one, again, is mostly positive until the end, and if you've seen this, you know the ending is more than enough to have it be on this show. You see a little sad face being highlighted there? They're, it's not like they didn't give you a warning. <laughs> And that's true too, Nelson Eddy does all the voices in this. Uh, he was a very popular opera singer at the time, and sometimes it really is amazing to think he's doing all of these voices, because he has to go through uh, a fair amount of ranges, and even though he's a baritone, uh, he still really has to stretch it. A singing whale? What do you know? I don't believe it. A lot of times it's hard to tell, sometimes it's pretty obvious, usually whenever he has to imitate a woman. I don't believe it! You can pick up on that pretty fast, but still a phenomenal voice. Case in point. This intro alone kind of shows how they were trying to save on money because I think everything in this introduction is something they already animated before. Those clouds, I think, are from Sorcerer's Apprentice. This little witch that flies by uh, is clearly from Night on Bald Mountain. I mean, you could just animate a different witch there. What the hell even is that? <laughs> but they were in such a rush, they're like, uh, just grab the one from Night on Bald Mountain. That looked witch enough. <laughs> Just a little back page item about a voice that sang at sea. And I'll admit, I go back and forth that they make Nelson Eddy the uh, spoken narrator in this. And not at all that he isn't uh, wonderful at doing. He has a very nice, uh, soothing voice. And Tati Tati was in for a wonderful surprise. But I kind of want this to be an opera. I wanted it to all be singing but uh, it does break somewhere uh, after about the first few minutes here, and he does just speak. On the one hand, uh, yeah, it drives me nuts because I wish this was operatic. It's about an operatic whale, but at the same time, he has such a gentle, calm voice that it is very nice to listen to, so I think it still works pretty well. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. The look at this guy always freaks me out. That face just gave me nightmares. What is up with his eyes? That thing's gonna eat my dreams tonight. And headline followed headline. That's my favorite of the newspapers. Ocean Liner serenaded. And even the great impresario of the Grand Opera. Oh my god, that guy. What a voice. <laughs> what a phenomenal voice. I really like the animation on this guy. If you go to operas, 
you've seen guys like this kind of like a mix of like a, a conductor and a singer as well even the way he kind of scratches his head is very delicate <laughs> with his fingers up but he's not a villain either i really like that this guy thinks he's doing uh, uh, something very kind and smart he thinks that the whale has eaten an opera singer so he's gonna get a ship to go and save him and also at the same time exploit him <laughs> and put him in his opera houses and stuff so i i really like this setup in general because it is a tragedy but there's not exactly a villain in it publicity, publicity, publicity. is it me or this legitimately great music i mean so a lot of the music in this is from uh classic operas but uh th th this whole first chunk here is written just for this and it really kind of gets the momentum going and it kind of gets you excited and it has a, a fast good beat and there's a lyric to every single note in there oh get me a great big schooner and get me a good harpooner photographers and reporters doesn't it get you excited doesn't it get you into it? i legitimately would watch an opera about this if <laughs> anyone ever wrote like a short one or something and for those of you that want to see this on disney plus i will let you know it is not on disney plus this might be the reason why mama's little baby love shortening shortening mama's little baby love shortening bread now this is a song that was used a lot in that time uh, it was in other disney cartoons donald duck <laughs> sang it weirdly enough i actually grew up with this song at a uh in kindergarten that's one of the songs they would sing but they changed one very important word they changed it to mama's little baby so this was a very common song like even when i was growing up like i said just with some of the words changed i doubt it's very common nowadays even if they change the words. That's you, Willie. He's looking for you. Our Willie. Going to sing grand opera. See, as a narrator, he really knows how to make it just sound so wholesome. Just our Willie gonna be an opera singer. I, I mean, they're just getting ready to twist that knife when they jam it into you at the ending. Figaro. Figaro. Despite him being very cartoony, I mean, he's very traditional, like, uh, Goofy, Donald, Mickey, all that stuff, I mean, drawn in that style, you still feel the size of this thing. Every single time he appears, even though he's not moving super large, still somehow the way it's shot and the fact that they do keep his size, for the most part, pretty consistent, uh, you really do get an idea of just how massive uh, this creature is. <laughs> See, he keeps saying that, and I think that's very important that they really do want to emphasize it's a misunderstanding. Like, like he just didn't get the idea that this is actually the creature singing. Well, he could sing in three separate voices. Tenor. Baritone. So Nelson Eddy was known best for being a, a baritone, but uh, if you practice enough and stretch it enough and, and you know, it, it is a muscle, uh, it, you can strengthen it to do other ranges. You can still tell that baritone is where his comfort zone is, but it's still really impressive he can get uh, as much of a range as he can. I, I mean, it's still very impressively done. I mean, this really was like a massive, massive talent. Then you can get really creative and have this whale be able to do that, you know, where he can practically sing his own opera because he can do like three different voices. Uh, it's very, very creative. But yeah, it's a cartoon. You can take all this fantasy and really push it to the next level and have fun with it. this would have worked as well if you didn't get a singer as good as him because yeah he really finds the emotion of this music i mean as a kid i honestly even for a lot of these uh i, I don't always know the operas but i just love the actual music i love the voice if his voice was was good but not great i don't think it'd be nearly as powerful imagine a whale singing opera and here's a good example of him being in this opera house he's still moving the same as most uh, cartoony disney characters like i said donald duck or mickey mouse but the way they have this laid out and you see the way it's lit and the little people in there and stuff like that you still feel the size of it just the angle that they get is enough. I think anime is really good at that too. They're really good at when they have to kind of cut corners, just getting a really good angle that you feel the placement, the depth of feel of it. 
That's a good joke. Apparently the birds have been to the show before. <laughs> And now most of this is Willy imagining himself in these scenarios where he's this big opera star at, you know, all these incredible uh, opera houses. And again, for me, and maybe some of you watching, like, this was a really wonderful intro to opera, because you just want to know these stories, you want to hear more of the music, and you want to hear these amazing voices sing them. I mean, okay, again, that's clearly a baritone voice doing that woman's voice, but it's it's pretty close almost, isn't it? It's more when he has to do the really high-pitched ones that, you know, you can tell that's him, but, um, it, you know, for a second, it does fool you a little bit. <laughs> yeah, now it sounds like someone's choking Mickey Mouse. That's where you can kind of tell. <laughs> So this, I think, is kind of a ballsy move because you have him performing in, in what's essentially hell here, literally the scene before she dies. <laughs> now, on the one hand, you could say, well, what's well, giving a little bit of a transition. Things are about to get darker and harsher, you know, because he's about to be uh, harpooned here. But, um, man... That takes balls. <laughs> I always remember watching this as a little kid thinking, oh man, he, he's about to die now because, well, here's the hell sequence. I got to him. Well, that's it. That is a very good transition. First of all, that great background of the opera house. That, all the backgrounds of the opera house are really, really good. But then I like the way it dissolves back to the guy they're about to shoot the harpoon. It doesn't dissolve all the way. It's like his fantasy is suddenly interrupted. Like he's only starting to see reality again, and then it's too late. And you go from these red colors in the opera house to now the sky, it's later in the day, a storm's coming and the sky is red. And obviously these are very distressing colors. They're the colors of danger. And you get some really uh, just heartbreaking imagery here of the whale far away being harpooned. <laughs> And this is the only moment where they actually animate the whale like a real whale. Like when he falls into the water, it's a big splash and when he's trying to swim away, it's done much more like a whale would move. You feel the size and the massive weight of that thing. I think that was a good choice, uh, not only to do it more realistic, because again, it's that reality crashing down on you. And again, these wonderful uh, colors and clouds and so forth. But the fact that it's done far away. Nowadays, and kind of back then, the idea was, well, if it's far away, you don't see the detail of the suffering, it's okay. But sometimes it's far worse, and I get the idea that if you saw, like, him, you know, in his very cartoony way, getting, like, the pained eyes or something like that, it, yeah, that would suck, but this you have to leave to your imagination. And the fact that it, it looks much more real, I, I mean, to me, that is just so much more heartbreaking. <laughs> I like that addition, too, that he takes the harpoon gun with him, because that's indicating that then they never find him. Like, they never go and see whatever, that there wasn't an opera singer in there. So for all we know, maybe the people are like, oh, you tried, you couldn't save the opera singer, oh well. Um, and that just makes it all the more a tragedy. But don't be too harsh on Tati Tati. He just didn't understand. People aren't used to miracles. Again, I think Nelson's narration really, really helps, I'm sure, especially younger viewers, get through a moment like this, because this is a tough moment. You're just looking at this bird looking over where, like, his best friend used to be. And again, I like even the narrator saying, don't be too hard on the guy that killed him. Like, he didn't understand, like, you know, sometimes these, you know, miracles, as he puts it, are so difficult to understand, but in that way, they're never really forgotten either. Miracles never really die. In whatever heaven is reserved for creatures of the deep, Willie is still singing. Beautiful clouds here. Again, I, I think just the backgrounds in this 
Uh, it, you know, for the most part, there's not a ton to look at because you're mostly at the water. Backgrounds in the opera houses and uh, this ending here, the clouds becoming heaven. Again, looking cartoony as well, but sort of beautifully cartoony. They do make it very shiny and angelic and beautiful. Uh, it, it's a wonderful combination of two very different styles. This super cartoony style and just this really nicely painted glistening style. <laughs> This is a weird thing I don't usually comment on. Isn't the mixing in this beautiful, like the audio mixing? Uh, I mean, when you just hear that music going up to heaven there, I mean, d just through the audio alone, doesn't it just sound like you're really ascending into heaven? If you're wondering what music that is, I think that's from the opera Martha. And I know that because I specifically looked for it <laughs> after watching this because I always remember this. I, I mean, again, very heavenly music, very pleasing music, but always kind of this bittersweet uh, feeling. Yeah, there's some really nice recordings of it out there if you ever want to take a look yourself. I like this too because if you look really close on the clouds there, you can see little people on there. This ending actually really reminds me a lot of the ending of uh, Johnny Appleseed with the trees becoming clouds. I really love imagery like this. I love the music that goes along with it. I think it's a wonderful, perfect ending. And again, even though it is very silly, this whale with a little halo and wings and everything, but it, you got invested. It's earned an ending, this heart-huggingly silly. <laughs> Man, how can your how can your heart just not soar at that both soar and drop at the same time? Because you see like that just phenomenal painting there. I mean, shimmering and glistening, and it's just so uh, phenomenal the colors on it. But it's such a silly thing. I think there's like two fish <laughs> at the top of it. Oh, j just what a some sort of poetic weirdo put this together, and I buy all of it. <laughs> So there you go, that was the whale who wanted to sing at the Met, or Willie the Singing Whale, however uh, you want to refer to it. Um, I loved it as a kid, I love it now, and a lot of it is the ending, but even if that element was taken out of it, I still think it'd be a very charming cartoon. I think uh, the music and the singing would be really, really great. I think just the image of the singing whale is a lot of fun. I don't really know anyone else that's kind of copied this idea. You say the singing whale, you immediately think of this, or if you say like, I don't know, a talking cat or a talking rabbit, I, there's a lot of those. I always like stories as a child that teach you sometimes just unfair things happen that's life that's also death <laughs> sadly but it is something where there is usually like a silver lining to it and it makes you appreciate what you do have or have before or going to have you know just whatever the future throws at you and that there are things we're not going to understand there are going to be misunderstandings again I really like that there's not a villain there's not somebody you look at and say oh that jerk that meanie that terrible whatever Ever, even though I love villains uh, in movies and shows and so forth, this is a story that doesn't need it. It doesn't, in a strange way, need to stoop to something so simple because the ending is weirdly complex. For a kid, this is a very complex ending. And heck, I even argue for adult is kind of a complex ending. I like any kind of story that has a little bit of everything in terms of what you emotionally take in or finding that in between something that's really cheerful and really sad. Uh, even though they really emphasized the sad mask <laughs> at the beginning, and it is a sad ending. Uh, the whole experience, though, is kind of a nice mixture of both. So, did you see this uh, growing up? If you did, did you see it in Make My Music, or did you see it uh, on its own? And what were your thoughts on it, seeing it as a kid and or as an adult? It's better as an adult, or better as a kid, or is it good both ways, they're just kind of different experiences. Uh, let me know what you thought of this. Hey everyone, if there's any particular cartoon you want me to look at as being very dark or twisted, leave it in the comments below. Again, I'm not really looking for movie scenes or cartoons meant for teenagers or older. I'm talking about ones meant for little kids, but still scare the shit out of you. Whether it's an old cartoon or a new cartoon, let me know what you want me to look at. <laughs>